Okay. So again, this is the second in our leadership series. We do have another program coming up in March. Um, it is Stop Wasting Words. Uh, it is a book by Sean Mahar, uh, who is with us this evening, and Eric Eisenberg. Um, you can go to stopwastingwords.com to learn more about them, but it's Conscious Communication Strategies. And we are hoping that that will be an in-person program. We're keeping our fingers crossed. It is March 24th, um, a Thursday night at 5.30. So um, you can follow us on Facebook, Munson Library, or uh, Munson Free Library, or MunsonLibrary.com um, if you are interested in that program or any of our other great programs. Um, I do want to tell you, I have muted you all, but just so, just so you know, if you do need to speak, you are muted right now. Um, Lori has mentioned to change your name if you can, uh, put your, your name and your organization if you are involved with one, so we have a, a good idea of who's here. Um, again, for the people I've just admitted, we are recording this, and um, we have uh, Kathleen Dowd from Rainmaker, who works with Lori, and she will be monitoring the chat. So um, I just want to get started. I told Lori she can introduce herself, but um, I just want to say thank you, Lori. Uh, she is the founder of Rainmaker Consulting. We have worked together many, many years. Uh, she has helped our annual appeal grow. So um, I am a good reference. But I want to thank you for being here. She has written her new book, Choose Abundance. I have a copy on my desk. I highly recommend it. Please read it. Um, it goes into so much more in-depth fundraising, changing that culture of philanthropy. Uh, but you'll get some of that tonight, and you'll be as excited as I am. So, Lori, I am changing it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Hope. And it's wonderful to have so many of you here tonight. I really appreciate you coming out to learn more about um, Choose Abundance and the, the work that we've been doing at Rainmaker to help organizations grow and thrive um, in the work that they do and really hopefully fulfill their missions. So this might be different some, from some of the things that you've been on in the past. Um, I really am going to ask that you participate to the best of your ability. Um, I know that some people need to be off, uh, you know, off camera, but if at all possible, I would encourage you to do that. This idea of this book is about leaning into being extraordinary, being extraordinary in your organizations, creating something different than, uh, than you've ever done before. And while um, there are many different fundraising conversations, this is not a customary one. This is about how do we, how do, we do something way outside of the box that could forever change the trajectory of our organizations. And it requires being bold, and so my, um, my hope is that you can all, as a result of our time together, come away from this conversation with uh, ideas of how you could enhance the success of your organization. Um, or, you know, I've, I've heard about people finding ways that this could enhance their life. So what I'd love to do is have you first right off the bat. So by the way, does everybody agree to be at least a little participatory and help me out and take yourself off and mute? Good. Can you give me a thumbs Absolutely. Up? All right. Good. Good. <laughs> awesome. I want participation as much as possible. So would you do me this favor first? Um, into the chat, I would love it if you would put in there, what would you love to get out of tonight's session? So if you would just go over to the chat, stick in there, what would, what would be something that you would love to walk away with in the, you know, in the next whatever, 50 out 50 hours 50 minutes <laughs> what would you like to, 50 hours would be a real long time um so what would you what would you like to get out of this inspiration awesome a plan okay good we won't get a whole plan done but we'll give you lots of fuel to get going on your plan good great new ideas to engage our community new ideas ideas strategy awesome Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you for putting that in there. Um, oh, good. Ways to inspire board members, innovative ideas. Good. Inspired messages to share with potential donors. Awesome. Good. We have the right audience, it seems like. The growth mindset as it applies to organizations. Oh, I love that. Oh, I want to make sure I remember that. 
that's a good one because we talk about a growth versus a fixed mindset in a lot of the work that we do. So thank you. That's a good one. Um, okay. How to retain donors. It's all going to be connected in there. So I want to go back um, and say this to you, first of all. I have had the privilege over the last two decades of connecting with and learning from a ton of amazing organizations. And they're doing extraordinary work and you may be above, among them. It may You may be helping to educate people in our communities. You might be helping a social, you know, in a social service. You might be working on social justice issues. You might be working in the arts. You could be doing all sorts of extraordinary things. Work on, you could be working on environmental issues. You could be working on um, racial equity. There's so many things. And those organizations that I've met over the years, while they've totally inspired me, they've totally moved me, um, they've showed up having common issues. The common issues was that they weren't getting the funding they needed to be able to fulfill their mission. And they've become frustrated because of things like their board not engaged. They feel inadequate with donors and that they don't know how to really connect with them, that they have not very good donor retention. That was one of the desires was how do we retain our donors? Um, and they feel like they need something to make it, you know, a, a paradigm shift to make something new and different happen. And very often we've heard about, we don't want to be so transactional. We want to be more transformational or relationship based, but we don't know how to do that. And they feel very under-resourced and like there's a bit of a catch 22. How do we possibly do all of these things? So I'm going to um, ask you to answer two questions now in the chat. For, and Kathleen's going to drop those questions right into the chat for us. But the first is, would you consider your organization, if you're involved with an organization, to be small, medium, large, or extra large? And there are some really specific uh, definitions I have for that, just to make it so that we all aren't wondering what I mean by that. And the second part of the question is, what aspect um, of our society does your organization impact? So in other words, in general, your mission, like do you, what, what is it that you're doing to make the world a better place? So could you drop that in there, Kath? Is that, uh, you got that? Or is it not cooperating with you? You're on mute. You got that, it's not cooperating with me. <laughs> I just tried it three times, I'm gonna try it once more. Okay. There we go, okay, thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. That's all good. So, so would you go ahead and drop back into the chat? Um, what size organization you think you've um, would be your organization, and then what aspects of the society does your organization impact? Small community building, great. And if you don't know the budget size, you can estimate just your opinion on it if you don't happen to know that. Small art for the soul gallery, venue showcases diverse artists. I didn't get to see all of that. Unique experiences, inspired educational opportunities for visitors, collective students, small library users, Shutesbury, small, keeps pets together with families, nice. Small, we impact seniors 60 plus in, 40 commu in four communities. Small, small, a lot of small. International organization on literacy. Yep, medium, long lasting learning, small. Teeny tiny, <laughs> good, uh, good. A two person library and a specialty hospital, cool. Small resources area, uh, area for community. Small and medium community engagement, small international. Good. So, uh, so I, I hear a lot of small, up a little medium and a large, good, good. So I'm gonna tell you a story and I'm gonna give you a heads up that as I tell you the story, there's gonna be a quiz <laughs> at the end. So I'm gonna ask that you at the end of the story, see what you get out of it. And this is a story of what happened to me. So I did a lot of volunteering and I had a business. I had a wholesale distribution company. Uh, you'll never guess what I happened to do unless you happen to listen to the radio show that I was just interviewed on. Um, but I sold dog shampoo and tanning lotion. Yes, that's what I did. 
And it was a very good business. It was doing very well. Um, but what I would do is I'd volunteer with my time with an organization called Results. It was a, a hunger organization. And I cared deeply about the organization. And so I'd go and I'd volunteer. I'd go to these conferences and I would, I'd be at the conference. I literally would be in tears because I'd be like, why aren't I doing this? I want to sell something meaningful, not goop in a bottle. I want to sell something that makes a difference in the world. So after numerous conferences with this happened, I, the position opened as a development director and I put my hat in the ring and I said, I wanted to get that job. And they said, you're not skilled in that way. You've done sales. We need a development person. And after several attempts, um, and many really had to go back n numerous times. They even told me to go away and don't come back again. Um, I finally was offered um, the job and became their development person um, at Results. And I was so excited. I was in my dream job. But after a period of time, that honeymoon was over and I started to have some real struggles and I wasn't hitting the goal. And the executive director came to me and said, we got to do something. Between now and the end of the year, if you don't raise $40,000, we're going to have to have some layoffs. And, you know, you got to do something. So I went to the one donor that I had actually asked for money recently and asked if he would make a $10,000 gift. And he came back and he said, Lori, you know, we love you. We love the organization, but we just gave. We did. Right now is not a good time. So I hung up the phone and I burst into tears <laughs> and I said, oh, this is not for me. Maybe they should let me go. And I, in fact, went to my boss and said, I'm not sure that I'm the one to do this. And she said, you need coaching. Go and um, I call this woman, Lynn Twist. She's the author of the book, The Soul of Money. And she said, ask her if she could give you some coaching. And in fact, she came to our organization and she led a training and it was very amazing. It was inspiring. I learned a lot of different things. But one of the things that happened there forever changed my, my career trajectory. She, I, I had heard about somebody who had said that they had, um, that they had gotten a million dollar donor. And I, I just was like, that's really cool. Lynn, we should get a million dollar donor. And she asked me if I was willing to take a stand for getting a million dollar donor. And I immediately backpedaled thinking, I can't raise $40,000, how am I gonna do this? And she said, this is what you do. You essentially take your hat, your metaphorical hat, and you throw it over the fence. And once you throw it over the fence, you gotta go over the fence to go get that hat. And I thought, well, that's an interesting idea. And she said, and the other thing is you get yourself a committed listener, somebody who says, it's possible, you can do this. So that's what I took on. And I said, all right, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna go find somebody. I know somebody who will take a stand with me, who doesn't think I'm crazy, and we'll brainstorm and try to figure out how to do this. So I reached out to my friend, a volunteer named Peter, and we would see each other at conferences a couple times a year, and we'd run together. And as we did that, um, we'd brainstorm and we'd go like, who do we know? Who might save us? How are we going to do this? And it was always these big ideas that wouldn't really go anywhere. But we kept dreaming about what would this million dollars do for results? What would it mean for people living in poverty? What would it mean for the child survival rate, the global child survival rate, if we could get that money? And one time after several runs together, I saw Peter and I could tell he had a he was a little lit up and I thought maybe he found that that savior, which by the way, sort of shows how naive and misguided I was as a young development professional because there really are no saviors. But this is what he said to me. He said, Lori, I'm your million dollar donor. I had no idea that he had that ability. So he and his wife took up, a, a, made a pledge for a hundred thousand dollars a year for the next 10 years. So, it was amazing. It was exciting. It was really thrilling. So I'd like to invite you for a moment to um, share what you might have gotten out of that story. And then I'll tell you some of the things that I learned about it. So if you have an idea, just um, take yourself off mute. What's one thing that you learned out of, out of that story? You have to ask. You have to ask. The funny part is I didn't even ask him, but it, but you're right. It's true. That's actually a missing part of the story. That would have been my next question of you guys. What's missing? Oh, I see here. Um, we need a Peter. 
and our relationship building is important. Matt said that. Yep, I would agree. Good. Low, what else? low expectations bring low results. Yes. Who said that? I can't. Uh, Donna. Right. Low expectations bring low results, but higher expectations bring another. Good. It's like the mindset, right? It's the way that we're coming at it. Good. And you never know who you're talking to. You never know. You never know. I knew him. I knew that he was a, a giant donor in my world. Five thousand dollars was that what I knew that he gave. So I I don't know whether he had ever given more than that, but yes. What else? Anything else? I noticed that I like what Louise said it was often what you're looking for is right in front of you. Nice. Mm. Thank you. And using your network. Yep. Right. I love all of those things. I've never done this this way where I've asked these questions right here. And you guys learned a whole bunch of things that I didn't even, that I didn't think of, but that are all relevant in here. So let me tell you the things that I learned. I learned that my mindset had been in the way and that my shift in mindset made something possible. The whole idea of throwing your hat over the fence, taking a stand for something, if I had not taken a stand for it, it absolutely wouldn't have happened. There's no guarantee that taking a stand makes it happen, but you certainly increase your chances a whole lot by taking a stand. Having somebody who's a committed listener, who thinks that it's possible and doesn't say, oh, you're crazy, Lori, forget about that. That makes a huge, huge difference. Also, that I, that Peter got enrolled in what it meant, right? He got enrolled in this vision of what would a million dollars do for this organization. And I saw that I had the ability to enroll somebody in something bigger and something possible. And that was a, you know, a huge, huge breakthrough for me. And I would have said, if it hadn't been said earlier, and don't forget to ask, because it was just a fluke that I did not ask him, but he happened to give it. But it does say something to that if you have that relationship and you have that connection and you have that shared vision, then it is almost, it almost doesn't need an ask. It does need an ask, but it almost doesn't need an ask if you do it really well. Okay, so I wanna stop and see if anybody has any questions so far before I go on to a bigger picture frame of this. Okay, and there is hope, yes. Marianne in Shutesbury, <laughs> there is hope, uh, including hope, right? Hope is with us, right? <laughs> right here. <laughs> okay, good. So I want to um, step back uh, and just ask a question. Could you raise your hand if either you're a development professional or your organization has a development professional just out of um, interest, uh, you know, so I can just sort of get a scan. And if you're not on video, if you have the ability to, okay, you guys do one, there are a couple, yep, I think that was a, yep, so a handful. And if you're on, uh, if you don't have your video on, it'd be great to know from you all too, if you could give it a thumbs up or something like that. Uh, so, okay. So not a ton of development people, mostly what we have is organizations without a development person. So that makes sense actually, because you're a lot of small organizations. Flashing back to 2014, a national study came out from the Haas Fund out in San Francisco. It was called Underdeveloped. It was a study of 2,700 executive directors and development directors. And they were looking at the state of fundraising in the United States, and they saw that there were a lot of problems, that there was a, 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 what they called a revolving door of development people. So when, they, when an organization had a development person, they didn't stay for more than a year and a half on, on average, that few development directors were embracing fundraising, and there was often not a big connection if there was a development person between the, the ED and the DD. Um, it was in many cases thought of to be an evil necessity and board members were not um, very engaged at all. They basically noted that they lacked the conditions for fundraising success. And what they said was needed and what was missing was a culture of philanthropy. So I'd been doing this work for 
a decade, more than a decade when that came out. And I was so ecstatic about this idea that it was possible to have this idea or that there was universal agreement that a culture of philanthropy was missing. However, what I found was there wasn't anything that I knew of, no resources that I could find that actually told you, how do you do it? How do you make it happen? How do you build this elusive culture of philanthropy? So I wanna talk about what is it first, okay? So when you hear the word philanthropy, what comes to mind? Anybody wanna just share your thoughts? What do you, you hear the word philanthropy, what comes to mind? WGBH. I'm sorry, could you say that one more time? WGBH, and all the people w they list that are in our local NPR, the people that are giving to health programs. Got it, got it. You think of the list of philanthropists, the big, the big name, yes, good. What else? Valley Gives. Valley, Valley gives. gives. Remember Valley Gives? Yes. Um, yeah. 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 And so then online giving days. Um, and that was really, uh, I think that was really a capacity builder for small nonprofits. Um, yes. For, yeah. You know, um, and, um, and it raised the level of philanthropy in Western Mass, you know, for a short amount of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I thought it was really exciting. Yep. Good. Great. And so you, so when the word, when you think of who a philanthropist is, what do you think that that means? Wealth, big donations. Big yeah, donations. Lots of money. <laughs> lots of money. Great. So I, when most, I believe that, I believe that a philanthropist is someone who has a vested interest in whatever the program or cause is great great all of these are great answers so lots of times when people say the word the philanthropy or philanthropist or philanthropy they're thinking about the the one percent the super rich individual that comes in and kind of saves the day um by I, everyone is welcome to the culture of philanthropy table so super wealthy people are certainly welcome but it's not just limited to that i like to use the definition that is actually the root of the word philanthropy, the Greek root, and I like it gender neutral, um, and that is love of humankind. So when you hear me talk about a culture of philanthropy, I am talking about this idea of that everyone has, um, has something to give. It might be money, it might be other resources, but it's about being generous in whatever way you have to be generous with whatever you have in abundance. Now I'm gonna move on to culture. So what, how would you define culture? Anybody have a, a thought of a definition of culture? And not the yogurt kind. <laughs> <laughs> a set of behaviors and attitudes that um, forms a, a way of being. Good, you get to leave this course next. You got two out of three <laughs> and you didn't leave out the one that is usually left out. So I'm gonna jump right into the definition. It includes three different things. It includes the, the behaviors. It includes the attitudes, the heart, what I call the hearts and minds. And it also include, includes the structures, right? So when you talk about systemic racism, right? There's systems and structures that hold that cultural thing in, in place. I think that's a, a just a really good example of how you can see that. But, it, but in any, let's just take it on, you know, a family level, right? That the culture of a family is there's certain structures. You have dinner together or you don't have dinner together. You have, um, you know, people come and go or they all come and go at certain very specific times. And the, their attitudes and thoughts and do you sit around the table and talk or does the teenager put their headset on or, you know, what are all of those things that have to do with a family culture? So every organization, every group, and I love, oh, Matt, right, the way things are done around here. So that um, sounds very much like a Seth Godin. Is that where you got that from? Where did you go? Is that right? No? So Seth Godin says, uh, the, way, the way we do things around here is what the culture is, right? So it's not unusual for, um, for people to sort of know. They don't really know what it is, but it's there. So the thing about culture is that it's very difficult to see 
unless you are in it. I'm sorry, unless you're out of it. When you're in it, you can't see it, right? It's like being in a, a, a fishbowl. And that's thus the cover of my book, by the way, with the fishbowl, right? That the whole idea is that if you're in the murky water, you very often can't tell. You have to be outside of it in order to see it. Why is this important? If you don't know the culture that exists around you, it's very difficult to make change. So in my book, we talk about how to make culture change. First, by revealing what your culture is and helping you to see what your culture is. And in fact, we have a resource that's on our webpage that um, actually was having a little snafu earlier today, but hopefully it'll be fixed and working soon, um, where any organization can go there and have it, a group get an assessment of your organization about the, the degree to which you have a culture of philanthropy. So you can take a look at it and see it. And, um, and so, I, you know, it's a big piece of it. So I wanna just stop and say this, that scarcity and um, the, the things, one of the main things, sorry, I just got a little bit sidetracked in my little order of how to do this. But as we look at the culture, understanding the degree to which we have scarcity in our organization is the way that we basically step out of our fishbowl. We could also talk about the degree that there's abundance, but we wanna keep that. The thing that we wanna reveal and maybe transform is the degree to which we have scarcity thinking in our organization. And I learned a lot about that from Lynn Twist. That was actually one of the key messages that I got from that book. So why again, is this so important? Let me say this, every day we got bombarded with messages that we aren't enough, that we need more, that there's not enough stuff that we have to buy right now. There, we, there's an advertisement that I like to show when I have a slide deck that says, save yourself a lifetime of regrets and get this new kitchen. That's the message that we're getting. The Union for Concerned Scientists says that on average, um, this was number, a number of years ago, that there's 3000 messages every single day that we get that say that we're not good enough, you know, that we should have that supermodel body, that we should have that sexy car, that we should have that beautiful home. And when we get that message all the time, what it does is it has us start to feel like we are coming from a place of inadequacy. So I obsess with this concept of, of scarcity because I think we're not recognizing it. And if we don't recognize it, it has us. So, for example, if I said to you, I could never run a marathon, what do you think? You think I'm gonna run a marathon? Anybody think I'm gonna run a marathon? If I start by saying I'm not gonna run, a, I could never run a marathon, right. So if you say I could never raise a million dollars, guess what? If you say, or your board says, or if you're on a board and you say, we tried that, that could never work for us, or um, that's impossible, or I don't know anyone with money or fundraising is an, a necessary evil. Guess what it manifests? So what happens is so many books and there are a lot of really good books out there, I have to say, are about the behaviors and they're about the structures around fund development, but they overlook that mindset. That's why uh, Christina and Cindy got the uh, extra credit points over there for having the mindset and the behaviors, the, but all three need to be examined and pulled apart and looked at and reassembled, if you will, to have the desired culture. So I'm gonna pause and just see um, if you have any thoughts or questions that you wanna ask or share about that, that might, does this resonate for you? Any thoughts from anybody? Don't be shy. All right. I'm, I'm on another board um, that is a nonprofit that raises lots of money to help 
uh, uh, Scottish Terriers who have, whose owners have difficulty funding medical care. And we found that the best thing in the world is that we use is testimonials. And we make the person that's giving a dollar feel as important as the person who's giving us a thousand dollars. And we started out with a budget of $600 four years ago, and we're up to 200,000. Wow, nice job. That's and, awesome. And we've spent 100,000 on, on assisting dogs. Awesome. But, but I think the important thing is that people have to feel that they're important and that they have to be aware of, we're very transparent. We publish our, our financials <coughs> quarterly and they're published so that everyone can see them and that the money that we're, we're taking is really going to what they feel is important. So I think that is part of the success of it. That's great. And so, yeah, and I'm going to talk in a little bit about um, about a number of the things that you actually touched on upon there, Donna, um, because there are lots of really good um, opportunities moving forward. Um, I, I want to highlight something in the chat where Jean says that we certainly convince ourselves of negative thoughts, even worse if it's in an echo chamber, reinforcing each other, scarcity of hope. And I would agree that there can be a vicious cycle where, you know, if you, um, you know, I used to say go into the workplace, I don't know how many people are in their workplace on a regular basis, but, you know, you go to get a cup of coffee and somebody talks about how, you know, the idiots on the road and then the next person talks about the, you know, the, you know, terrible weather and then the next person starts to talk about, you know, COVID and then you go back to your desk and like, okay, how am I going to inspire people now? You know, how am I going to generate that? And so it does matter that you um, that you see it. And one that thing that's really important is that organiza organizational leaders need to understand that if you don't understand the culture and the impact of the culture, then it will have you. It will it will you know rule the show. So I'm gonna stick with this scarcity for a few more minutes. I know that's not the favorite thing of anybody who's an optimistic organizational leader, but it's important. So I wanna consider the various steps of fundraising. And so I'm gonna walk you through those and ask you hypothetically, if you were at a, st at a, um, at a point of creating a fundraising plan with your organization, and people said things that came from a place of scarcity. What's some examples of what people might say? And I'd like to do this like popcorn, like, you know, we don't have time to plan. We need money now, like that. What are some of the things that people might say if they were coming from a place of scarcity around planning? We don't have enough staff. We don't have enough staff. Great. What else? We need some money to help with fundraising. Right, we need money for fundraising. It's this vicious cycle. You can't start fundraising until you have money, but you don't have money. Good, what else? We can't find extra time. We can't find the time to do it, right. Shortage of time. By the way, my, my number one scarcity issue is, my, is time. By the way, and, and even if I teach about it all the time, nobody, nobody gets to get away without ever having scarcity thinking. Nobody that I've ever met so far. So, um, okay, good. So if you are in the, at the next stage of fundraising where you're starting to identify individuals to give to your organization and you came from a place of scarcity, what might people say? We don't have any donors like that. Um, that's what I say. That's it. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> yes. And you get extra credit. You get extra credit if you identify scarcity thinking in your in yourself. That's awesome. Thank you, Marianne. Yes. That's great. Good. All you had to do is listen, right? Like to just turn that channel up a little bit, right? <laughs> That's good. Good. What else? Any other things that are said when you're identifying individuals to give? This is usually the biggest one that a million people know. I have a million things here. Is there a scarcity of scarcity conversations? Oh, uh, you know, a lot of times you say um, that that those donors have already given to causes they care more about, or they've 
they've already committed too many of their resources in a given year. They're not right. going to find they're not going to find our cause a uh, high enough priority in their giving. Great, great, exactly. It's like these are the messages, right? Uh, how about like that person can't give? Have you seen their car? Right. We, we sort of make up things about what people should or or they're so rich they should be giving to us. Why aren't they giving to us? Right. So there's a real range of um, of things that we could say about individuals or I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to be, uh, you know, whatever, putting pressure on my friends or things like that. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Okay. If you're thinking of cultivating relationships with people, so you're at the, like, we need to go cultivate relationships. What, what um, would be the scarcity language that might come up there? I don't know these people well enough. Okay, good. What else? I don't know where to go to find more people. Okay, good. How about if you already had the people and it was about going to, to cultivate the existing donors or, or potential, you know, you already had folks a little bit engaged. What might people say about, oh, we have to cultivate them? I, I just don't know what to say. Um, Got it. Got yeah. it. Yeah, I don't have a fully baked plan to give them or I don't have a, a fully fleshed out set of things to, to present to them. Yep. And I see from Jean, um, they're going to, I don't, I don't know what to say. She's put that in there. The second you said it, Marianne, it was kind of funny that I was like, did you put your in there at the same time? Um, they're going to laugh at this request or scoff. Yes. Yes. All of that. Okay, good. What about if it's ready, it's time to ask them. So somebody's been involved with the organization and now it's time to ask. What might scarcity language be around asking? I know you probably can't give as much as we could really use from you, but you know, can't you, you know, we could at least use a hundred dollars from you. Even if you can't, you give us the thousand that we really need. You low ball, okay. basically. Low balling. Okay, good. Right. Under, so under asking. Yep. What else? Not understanding how to, uh, how to send out your appeal, how to actually connect with a large enough base of people. Okay. Good, just don't know how to go about doing it. Okay. Are there people who don't want to ask because they are afraid that they'll get a no and feel rejected? Does that show up? Mm -hmm. Yep, okay, good. good fears one. of, or fears of not being liked or right. Okay, what about, um, so stewardship, and by the way, let me talk about what stewardship is. Um, stewardship is like uh, not just thanking, but showing people that their investment in your organization was was worthwhile. So if you were to be working with some teammates, whether they're staff or whether they're volunteers, where might scarcity language be about um, thanking people and appreciating them and and making sure that they get to see that their investment was a wise one in your organization? It takes money and time to thank, and we're already in a scarce position. <laughs> yep, yep, great. That's very often the biggest one, is that it is not, that it feels like we have no time for this. We got the money, phew, okay, let's go get some more money or whatever and not spend the time. Okay, so, I would imagine right now you can imagine, come up with some different scenarios where you run into scarcity thinking. So has everybody come up with some ideas of, of examples of scarcity thinking where they've either, you've either done it yourself or you've heard it within your organization? Did some of these resonate for you? And mm -hmm. yeah, okay, good. One of the things I, I really recommend in a very strong way is to take some time 
go back to your organization and talk about scarcity language and start to identify where it exists. And the reason is this, is that for organizations that are having struggles with raising money, it's easy enough to step over looking at that. And then the impact ends up being that people don't rise to the occasion and aren't necessarily willing to step in and help make change. It doesn't, it because making culture change takes a tremendous amount of work. So it's really important to do that. And so I encourage you as one of the things that you take away from this is that you go be a scarcity detective because once you know it, you can start to create and generate something new. This book has come up um, and come together because I saw the gap that existed with a lot of organizations and I was able to teach a course um, those of you who are local may have heard of the Harold Grinspoon Foundation. Uh, I have been doing work with them and have worked with their grantees. And those camps, it's what I work with, is, is Jewish overnight and day camps. What we've done is we've started to see what they could do to take this model and, and work it with a group of people. There are a couple of things that are unique about it besides the fact that I'm talking about culture. It takes a team. And so I work with groups of people, so both staff and board members together, and they together make a plan for how are we going to have the culture change that we want. So it has to do with those things that many of you talked about, having a plan, having a strategy, but looking at that and making those decisions through the filter of a culture of philanthropy, through a culture of abundance and noticing where there's scarcity. I wanna um, talk about just a couple of things. Um, and let me, let me just pause and say, do you, are there any questions? And I'm gonna ask you to, yeah, any questions that you have about a culture of philanthropy, about this work and yeah, anything like that? And I wanna open this up, especially to Kathleen and to Hope to see if there's anything that you think might be missing that would be good to talk about before I, I talk about specifically what the book does. Anything for either of you? I, um, I wanna just say that um, the scarcity detective game, and it's certainly in the book, it you know spelled out the exercise, but it's really simple to do. And if there's nothing else that you take away tonight, um, Doing that, doing that with your home, with your family, with your children, and with your certainly with your workmates, with your board, to help see, I mean, that dirty water analogy, you just don't see it. If you do take some, take some little cards, send people off, have them write down all the different scarcity messages they start to see owning their own, like I think it was Mary Ann did tonight. I mean, it's incredibly powerful way to shift even just the slightest shift towards um having more abundant um lifestyle so i would highly recommend you look at that doing that exercise alone great thanks kath okay so i want to give you a couple other little nuggets that you could potentially take away i heard a bit about storytelling um, I'll, i will tell you where the book's available but well Give me, I'll do that in just a moment. So the, we, there's one tool that I just want to give away also, in addition to the one that Kathleen just met, uh, mentioned, being a scarcity detective. The other is the idea of mission moments. So a few of you mentioned the compelling stories. I think it was Donna with the Scottish Terriers. There are stories in your organization of what is meaningful and, and, and how, how something happens, like a story, this, you know, there's this thing that happened in this moment and those moments inevitably happen all the time. One of the organizations that I've worked with decided to really embrace this as part of their culture of philanthropy plan. 
And what they did was, it's an organization that works with adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And what they did was they had all of the staff trained on, we're looking for those magical moments that happen, and we're gonna capture those. And we're gonna have it be almost like a contest every week, who's got a great story. And each time that the managers would lead a meeting, it was a fairly big organization, they had about 100 staff, they would start the meeting with a mission moment. What that did by telling that story was that staff got re-inspired by the work they were doing, uh, and they started to have a catalog almost of stories that they could share with their supporters. This is one of the most important things that you can do is make sure that these stories get carried throughout the organization. But if, but if you look at it, it's addressing, this. there's a structure to make it happen. We're gonna do it this way at these meetings, board meetings are gonna start this way. We're gonna start it anytime there's a staff meeting, we're gonna share an amazing story just to get us grounded and get us in touch with why we're doing this work that we are, right? So that's a key piece is to have your structure that you have the behaviors, you make the make it a pattern and make it so that you're doing it all the time, but that it's coming from the hearts and minds. And it changes people's attitudes when that's what they're where they're coming from. Another is to um, have everyone have a role in building a culture of philanthropy. So that program staff obviously have a key role in that scenario I just gave you, right? And um, board members have a role. They could be sharing it with their friends and people out in the community. That helps to fill in, what do I say? That's what, that's what cultivation is. Oh my gosh, I just heard this wonderful story about a student at our school who fill in the blank, right? So all of these different, you know, individual, um, you know, narratives that come along and you can connect people and what they've got in abundance. So, those are can just. I, can I you, just interrupt for a minute? I sure, go ahead, Kathy. I just want to tell a quick story because it's one of my all-time favorite success stories in terms of what Laurie just said about everybody has a role. So, and it's in the book. Um, but again, a, a, an organization out in I think it was uh, Wisconsin, um, mm -hmm. environmental organization. Yeah. Small, wanting to build a new building, right? And they did the work. They 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 hired Remaker and did the work around culture of philanthropy. They worked with um, one of the consultants. And they taught their entire staff all about the program, hearts and minds, culture, all of it. And this young woman went, she would take people on canoe trips and she took a group of people out on a canoe trip. Now, normally she might not have ever thought about her role in that whole big picture, right? The bigger picture of the organization. She's just taking people on a canoe trip. But because she had been trained along with every other staff member, she talked about the organization what its vision was, where it might, where it wanted to go, and what was on that, who were in that canoe were two people, um, a husband, it happened to be spouses, and one of them was an architect, and one of them was a landscape ar architect, and they ended up getting, like, pro bono, <laughs> pro bono, point, all their plans, both for their landscape, I mean, it was worth thousands of dollars, and they were new, they became new connectors to the organization, so that's just one small idea of making sure everybody in your organization understands they have an ability to make an impact. Doesn't matter what they do from a security guard to a janitor, to a program person, to someone that takes people on canoe rides. One of my favorites. <laughs> Great, thank you, Kathleen. That was awesome. It was so funny when I saw you do this, I thought I was like, is she waving to somebody in her room? <laughs> I didn't know that you were trying to get my attention. So sorry about that. <laughs> I was like, what's she doing? Anyway, good. So. Um, all while paddling, yes, and that was so cool. And by the way, you know, this person had never really, you know, she heard David, our colleague's voice in the back of her head saying, okay, I guess I'm supposed to get to know people. And that was really what it was about. So what the book does is it's a very practical guide that talks you through the whole process from first discovering the scarcity that might be in the way to generating something that you, is your desired culture. How do you put a team together? All sorts of different exercises are through there. So we're offering it at a 15% uh, coupon code, which by the way is months and free to get your copy. 
it's on our website. You can go to our Rainmaker or Choose Abundance that is there, um, that Kath put, I'm pointing to it over there because it's on my screen over there, that Kathleen put in there. Um, it is not yet um, available um, at Amazon. It's uh, eventually going to be on Amazon, but it isn't at the moment. We're just selling it directly here. If you have um, an organization that's interested in using it as a team, and getting 10 or more copies, you can actually reach out to Kathleen. Um, her email is just like mine, only it's Kathleen at rainmaker.com because we would help you to do that. And we also would offer with that a, um, you know, a, a pro bono conversation with your team if you wanted to go that route and do that. Um, but again, it walks through the various steps, including how do you do it and what are the exercises and so on. So I'd like to have people just for one moment think about, and I'm just going to let it be quiet for like a minute or so, uh, one thing that would be a takeaway. And um, I, I would normally put you into uh, pairs, but I won't, I won't do that at the moment. Uh, but what is one thing that you could, would take away from this? And so maybe, you know, jot down a note to yourself. And then I'd love to have people share anything that you might take on one thing that you might have learned or unlearned. Actually, I'm going to write that right in the chat. Um, what have you learned or unlearned? And what might you take on? So I'll just give you a minute to think a little bit about it. So would anybody like to share anything? Oh, good. Jean's putting something there. Adding the practice of sharing mission moments at our board and committee meetings, collecting them to share and back out in fundraising, elevator pitch, et cetera. Great. Good. And, and my recommendation, by the way, is yes, when it comes down to asking, you could use it then. Um, and, you know, but I would recommend not necessarily like waiting to ask. I think sometimes that there's this myth that you need to be asking like right away. And I would suggest that you take your time and you get to know people and get to know what they love about your organization and what might be a, a connection and a way for them to get engaged as a starting point. Just think about dating. As I have often said, if you're on a first date with somebody and they say, hey, let's get married, you'd be like, whoa, 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 you're creepy. But somehow in fundraising, it's somehow expected that you meet somebody and go, hey, you wanna give to my organization? Mm, not, a, not a good idea, right? So think of dating when you think about getting to know people. You wanna take little steps, get to know each other, see how you wanna be involved. And then afterwards, you want to also you know, go further and and re and really reconnect and really see how you can build something. And um, the more that you get to know people and have them feel committed to your cause, very much like what I expressed with Peter, much greater chance of someone increasing their giving over time. So, and yes, hope we need to define our culture to change it. Absolutely, it's a big that's a big deal, and that's where having a team of people explore it and think about it can make a huge, huge difference. And um, and I guess that one plus one hope is that that's Jean agreeing. Is that right? That Jean's given it the yeah, I agree, I think. Yeah, all right, good. That's right. I, I like what Hope had to say, yeah. Uh, okay, good. All right, so we're really right towards the end. Um, I'm gonna, uh, Kat's gonna put some things into the uh, chat about ways that you can uh, be involved. I do encourage you to get the book, get the book for your library. Um, use that code to get a 15% discount on it. Um, if you're uh, interested in doing a deep dive, you can do that as a group. Um, you can also sign up for the e-newsletter at our website. Um, we have lots of pointers all the time and you might find that to be useful. Also, um, 
download a sample chapter. There's one on our website. If you want to go check that out, it's free. You can just download it. You can also look at our other resources that are there. Most of the resources that are there are especially relevant if you're reading the book and might not be quite as relevant, but uh, you're welcome to take a look. And I love to do speaking engagements like this. So if you have a, a group or a network or a conference that you're uh, involved with, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Anybody have any last um, insights, anything that you came up with? I'd love to hear just what some of the things that you learned. Would anybody please take off your mic and share what you've learned today? Can we have Peter's phone number? I saw that, very funny. No, you can't have Peter's phone number. <laughs> Good, Any somebody tell me something you learned out of this so I know that this was worth our time. It, it really was worth our time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can't say I any specific thing. Sorry. Somebody else is trying to, um, I can't say anything specific thing, but I've written down a whole bunch of stuff while you've been talking. So thank you. You're welcome. Great. I like the concept of uh, the power of testimonials, both ex internally, like sharing them at your board meetings, uh, pumping yourselves up at every meeting, uh, but and, and then also the power of the testimonial external, like yep. uh, what was shared about how powerful a tool that is using donor testimonials, uh, whether they gave a dollar or a thousand dollars, making them feel valued, but also utilizing those testimonials um, externally and internally um, to share the message. Great, thanks Matt. Like, uh, how great you are at demonstrating passion for a cause. Um, very lively, thank you. I also appreciate how much time you paid and gave attention to if I'm dark on the inside and pessimistic and worried and anxious and scarcity thinking, it's very difficult for me to shine a light on the outside. Um, very difficult. So we really do need to, to kindle that fire inside ourselves as we go out and do work with people. Great, could you tell us what, what stop, stop Wasting Words is? I'm curious. Uh, very quickly, uh, most words have far less value than people give them credit for, far less value. So people pay more attention to their words than what they're trying to accomplish. So Stop Wasting Words is about streamlining our conversation so we can be more successful in everything we do. Nice. I like it. And you said that in such a streamlined way. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I try to practice what I preach. Not always successful. <laughs> Thank you. Good. You and me both. I'm the same. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Anybody else, something that you've gotten out of uh, our session tonight? I also right. like, you, you reinforce some of the thinking that we were having about being bold, your, your concept of throwing the hat over the fence and taking a stand for something, uh, the really, you know, the need to have a bold, strong vision um, that would make a donor want to, uh, to, to support your cause, you know? So, so I think that was a real encouragement of, of trying to be bold. Great. And I can't tell you the number of people that I've been telling that story for now a lot, a very long time. And I've had numerous people come back to me and say, I took a stand for something and, and, you know, either we got it or we got half of it and it was far more than we'd ever gotten before, you know, whatever that is. I encourage each of you to consider taking a bold stand for something um, for your organization and stepping into it and saying, what are we going to do? And finding yourself a committed listener who will help you um, to, to say that, you know, how could we, how could we do this? How could we manifest this? How could we make this reality a reality? So I encourage you on that note to go do that. And um, I thank you all for your time. Thank you, Kathleen, for being uh, in charge of the chat and hope for inviting us. And for over so many years, I've been very inspired by you. I've told stories about your library for years. <laughs> I have, I have. I, you introduced me to a new paradigm around what libraries can be. And well, uh, it was a long time you. ago. You it <laughs> it so. was a long time ago, yes. Yeah. And Lori, thank you, because I've sat in on a lot of your workshops and uh, I learned I learn something every time and it just gets me inspired all over again. And um, 
even though this is being recorded, my board is in trouble at the next meeting. <laughs> so. <laughs> Haven't listened to the recording. Exactly. Good. All right. Yes. So get the book. And um, I'd, I'd love to partner with any of you. You know, reach out if there's any way we can be helpful. So thank you, everybody. And um, have a great night. Yes. Thank you all for coming. Okay. Bye-bye.